Uh, we talk a lot about sustainability, actually even earlier today in this room, and there was a bit of a debate what sustainability means, what are the definitions and how we can uh, describe sustainability. And the one I like most is to say that sustainability is thinking about our children. Everything we do, we can build a new factory, we can uh, drill a new pipeline, we can uh, do a big uh, project with a lot of money. But if we don't think about our children, about the next, next generation, we can uh, really destroy the ecosystems and the uh, sustainable future. So for that matter, I would like this panel to focus on what universities can contribute for sustainable future. First to speak is Feridun Hamdulakur, who is the president and vice chancellor of the University of Waterloo in Canada. So, I can, I can get it started, and if this fails, I'll use my lecture voice. Speaking of lecture, as a good professor, as I always say, yes, this will be included in the final exam, so please uh, pay attention. <laughs> um, I want to first thank the organizers for having this conversation here. Uh, it's, about, it's a critical point in time to have this conversation. We're about 50 years too late behind. Right in front of, eyes, uh, our, of our eyes, and we all know, we don't see any further evidence that taking sustainability not as a sidebar, not as something that we, it will be nice to add to what we do, but make it an integral part of everything we do. As you said, it goes far behind what it is that we want to leave to our children, what it is that we want to leave or the great-grandchildren of, of our children. And for that, the universities must play a central role, uh, role because education is absolutely critical. What we are doing, we have a, one part of the university, for example, at my university, over 480 faculty members, researchers, they're working on one or another aspect of sustainability. On the other hand, we have people working on various aspects uh, from business development to power generation, and there is no connection. We are doing things, we are going in various directions, and this is the time that through our unbelievably rich, powerful education system, bring a lens, a powerful lens that everything has to go through that lens. We've been able to do this when it comes to equality and diversity and many other things, including mental health. But it is time that collectively we, institutions of higher learning all around the world, connect with the rest of the world, go all the way down to elementary primary schools and bring it all the way up to the highest level of learning and scholarship that if we are not paying attention to this, if we do not make this a very critical aspect of our existence, we will not be able to have this conversation in a world that we could all enjoy, prosper, and live in a very, very meaningful way. That's my message. What do I do? I, there were a lot of talks. So this decade, in 2020, the talk must convert into action. And what kind of action are we thinking about? For example, as I speak, and I'll give you two countries, India and China, they continue building coal-fired power plants. And the carbon dioxide emissions will keep coming out. At the same time, it's a fact, it's a matter of fact. How do we understand why this is happening at the same time I know that in China, as many coal-fired power plants are being established, equally they are establishing renewable energy-based uh, uh, power plants. Because there is awareness, we want to tip that scale. Technology will provide us some answer, but the key is to realize that 
what we are able to get away with today will not that won't happen in the future so everything every country every every society must take this as something that has to be taken very seriously and solidly integrated into everything we teach and we study and we research at our institutions. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much, uh, Feridun. Actually, what uh, you mentioned is quite interesting because uh, if we think of the six priorities of Davos, these are economy, ecology, uh, society, uh, technology, uh, geopolitics, and industry. All six of them, if we think the universities will have a large role to play. So really, you, you really point the finger into the core uh, driver of those uh, changes which sustainability demands. Let me now move to Alicia, you want to go second? Sure. Okay, please. Tell us more about uh, what your university, how, how, first of all, your own vision, yep. but also your university work in all of those six uh, elements uh, which Davos addresses. Thank yep. you. Was well, I think, um, as a, uh, I'm the Vice President of Economic Development for Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And as we think about how we position ourselves both as a leader and the economic driver within um, the um, mid-Atlantic region in the US, but also as a global university having a wide-ranging impact, what we've done is we've released done a couple of things. One, embedding sustainability across the university in all of our schools, having it as a top priority of research as well as of scholarship. But also what we've done is we've tried to incorporate the local community in the conversation around sustainability and then helping to form and shape policies that we both advocate for but also um, are engaged in. And so uh, we created a sustainability council which incorporates not only scholars from the academic portions of our university and the research um, arms, but also from our local community, given that we want to make sure that our actions are informed by not just our perceived needs and perceived perceptions of what sustainability means, within the context of a local community, but also from the felt need of those who are most, um, most impacted by our actions, both as anchor institutions, but also from the policies that we help to inform at the national and at the uh, global level. Thank you very much, Alicia. Interestingly, uh, if we talk about sustainability gap and governance gap, Universities are those who can address both the science, the natural science and the social science uh, aspect. And something interesting which happened just now is that two universities, Jindal Global Universities and University of Zurich signed a memorandum of understanding. And I'm very happy to see Michael Hengartner and uh, Professor Siraj Kumar with us today. So please, in the same vein, uh, tell us about your vision of uh, what is the role of global university addressing sustainability gaps. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to really congratulate Caspian Week to have made it a point to have a devoted panel on looking at role of global universities in promoting sustainable futures. And uh, this also shows a certain bit of vision and farsightedness about looking at these issues. Uh, second, I want to say that uh, universities are uh, almost so central to the sustainability discourse because it permeates everything that we want to achieve through the impact of what uh, human beings and organizations and institutions and corporation, corporations and, and governments can have on society. Uh, universities have an opportunity to shape young minds. It's also important for us to recognize that the sustainability discourse should not end up becoming like the corporate social responsibility discourse. As all of us know, CSR for a long time ended up becoming something that the companies and corporations would do on the side, but without really doing, uh, changing their entire framework, their entire, let's say, DNA of their functioning. Uh, given the fact that uh, there is no future without sustainability, universities need to provide that specific role in which what universities do in terms of inculcating a deeper sense of responsibility among young people, but also in relation to promoting knowledge and research as well as education, that needs to focus on sustainability. That's where 
partnerships play a very big role. Uh, and as it was mentioned, the University of Zurich and OPG and the Global University signed a memorandum of understanding. We in India recognize the importance of partnership and also learning from each other's experiences. And that learning from each other's experiences need to permeate the curriculum, the courses, the programs, the research, and also the commitment towards internationalization. Thank you, Raj. Michael. Thank you very much uh, also to Caspian Week for having invited us. I'm fully with Raj uh, on this. Universities are, have two key missions, research and teaching. And Raj very cognizantly now explained how training the next generation of leaders is absolutely essential if you want the next generation to actually have a new mindset rather than the current mindset. The second thing is we need to do research because obviously what brought us here won't get us there. We need to have new solutions, better solutions than the current ones, and that's where universities have a huge leverage effect. This is what we can do better than most others. Now, of course, universities also have USPs, so you have to focus somewhere. Two examples from my university, we're in Zurich, so you know what? We set up a center for sustainable financing, because obviously training the, the bankers in Zurich to promote fi sustainable financing will make a big leverage effect also with their clients. Second thing we did is we're strong in life sciences. We set up a center for biodiversity and global change, where we focus on remote sensing and gather high throughput and high detailed data, how the world changes, so that we can rapidly identify the areas where we need to point particular attention. And there, for example, one of our sites is in Russia, where we see also the biodiversity being quite threatened. So these are two examples how in research universities can contribute to solutions, Again, not only technology, but also in social sciences, in economics. And I think it's very important to do that because at the end, it will be a common solution. It will not be a technology solution alone. We will also have to change the way we think and we act. Absolutely. As we see, actually, the sciences already develop a lot of solutions. We hear how to address the carbon problem and the forest uh, and, and everything else. But what is missing, in, in, in particular in climate change, is the action by the government, by the business sector, by the non-governmental sector, and so on. So somehow preparing future global citizens to live in a sustainable future is quite a challenging task, we must say, in the university. Although the natural science has developed solutions, this will not happen without governance uh, change. Uh, we have also Ngin Gao, he was with us also yesterday, talking about leaderships and education. So please, le let us know the perspective from the Business School of Lausanne on the, uh, how the role of the universities can develop to address the sustainability issues. Thank you, Professor. Yes, I'm very happy to share the experience of uh, Lausanne Business School and how actually we implement sustainability in our um, uh, curriculum. Uh, what we do for already many years, and I think it's a very good practice, we stop the school for one week. So bachelor students, master students, they stop doing their regular curriculum, and for one week, they work on a project on sustainability. So we start with the development goals, we make teams, and each team pick, uh, pick one area of the uh, development goals they want to address, and their point is to find, try to find solutions, and to try to have a business perspective on how to roll out these solutions um, afterwards. So basically, they have idea generation, they come with a solution, it could be a service, it could be a product, they look at how to market it, they look at how to finance it, and they look at the financial impact of it. I think this is a fantastic start. But as you know, I'm very much focused on the leadership competencies for the 21st century. I believe we can go further. I think the next step could be to look at sustainability and incorporate it in every single aspect of the value chain of business. Because if, for example, you talk sustainability in HR, it has to deal with work balance, making sure that the people have a very happy work environment and they feel like they're inspired. If you look at it from the financial or accounting pr uh, uh, perspective, we have to look at the costing of the sourcing of the product that we're having. In the sourcing, the procurement, to look at what we are sourcing and how we are sourcing it. And when we bring for the customer the product or the service to understand that, am I actually bringing something of value for you because I know for you it's important to respect the environment and society. Do I do it with the product and the solution I'm bringing to you? So this has to be that far and to have it at every single um, 
content are part of the content of every single aspect of the value chain in the business schools. This is my perspective w for the future. Work. Thank you very much, Guy. Let me now go back to the speakers with another round of questions, and I'll start with Feridun again, uh, which is uh, how do we understand global universities? What makes universities global? What is the importance of internationalization of the students' experience? How much of your students, maybe you can go into a bit more specifics, what does your university do in order for students to be global citizens, but also the university as such to develop global standards? Please. So universities, many universities are the creation of their local communities. So we start at a local level and it is up to us now to align our institutions with the whole world. So to me, a global university uh, has to have some basic elements. One is it has to be connected with the whole world in two ways. Bring the world to your institution and take your institution out to the world. But more importantly, make sure that every student every faculty, every researcher, they are aware of, regardless of what they are doing, what they are studying, what they are researching, they are in tune with the challenges and opportunities of the world. They understand that, again, the global health issue, global environmental issue, global peace issue, they are all related to what they do. One day they are all going to converge. So if we want a long-term sustainable solutions to anything that we work on, we study, it has to be part of the broader world. For that, partnerships like we just witnessed here, understanding that a challenge of finding the right ingredient for their crop growth in one part of the world may not be applicable to what I do where I am should also be my issue. That with that, if we connect the dots, we're able to combining our resources, not just physical resources, our intellectual resources, and coming up with a pathway, not even a solution, I won't call it a solution, a pathway that will be long-term and sustainable for that we underline over and over and over again that internationalization, being global, is not something nice to have because you're recognized. It is the kind of impact you ought to, not you will enjoy making, you must make as an institution of higher learning. Excellent. I, I like how do you link the local necessity with the globality of the university. In fact, we often say, think globally, act locally. A lot of solutions need to be applied to communities where we operate. Who would like this? I apologize. I have to go okay. now. Thanks. But Thanks thank you very so much. Thank you, Feridun. Thank you. Let's give him a big applause. Thank you very much to be with us. Always welcome back to the Caspian Week anytime you're in Davos. Thank you, Feridun. Alicia. Um, as we think about um, what we do to, one, attract both the best and the brightest to do research at Johns Hopkins University, but also to be students of the student body, what we really think about is that pipeline. So through a number of initiatives, both globally and locally, we try to attract and foster the best talent, but do that regardless of their socioeconomic status currently. And so it's really about um, many of the efforts that we do to really harness the power of what universities at their utmost, at their best can do, which is to provide social, mo social mobility for individuals that otherwise without an education wouldn't have that. Um, and, the, and in tandem with that, as we think about finding solutions and crowdsourcing really solutions for global issues, we use Baltimore as a launch pad to really tackle those issues and make the linkages and synapses with the global um, challenges that are felt throughout the world. Excellent. Uh, good luck in this excellent effort. I really appreciate it. Raj. Uh, well, you know, I must say that the element of globalism within a university is under challenge in many parts of the world. Uh, in fact, this is a moment when uh, with, uh, we can use the word Brexit, we can use uh, uh, provincialism uh, as a framework of governance in many parts of the world, and universities are increasingly under stress to justify and assert their own position as far as their commitment to promote uh, global engagement. And this is a moment when universities should be working towards speaking truth to power 
and to assert their own commitment towards engaging globally. And this challenge is not going to be easy because there are enough reasons why universities could become short-sighted in this potentially uh, volatile political environment in which, uh, you know, governments tend to have a myopic vision in recognizing the merits of global engagement. So to me, globalism and global university imagination is so central to a university because within the word university, it has an element of universality and universe in it. And it's not something new that universities inevitably need to be global. They need to be concerned about issues that are affecting the humankind at large. They need to be addressing these issues and also potentially empowering students and faculty to appreciate and to engage in these issues. And to advance that, we need to focus on research, knowledge creation, publications, and to influence and impact both domestic and global public policy. This is excellent message, particularly in time when we see uh, tendencies of populism and nationalism in some countries taking over. And the voice of the people here is very important, but also when universities, and universities are full of young students, who also somehow echo the voice of the rest of the population is important. So when uh, universities speak truth to power, when they are in the front of the civil society action, we hope that that will also play the role against these tendencies of nationalism and populism. Maybe not the case in Switzerland as much as in the United States and India, but yes, Michael, your... Uh, yes, Switzerland is a special country, I must say. <laughs> um, no, actually, the University of Zurich is very um, privileged to be in Switzerland. We're a small country, we have few natural resources. That has forced the country very early on to become an open country. Right? So uh, that has generated a very interesting ecosystem in higher education and research. Um, a study in 2012 has shown that Switzerland actually is the only country in the world where there's more non-Swiss doing research and development in Switzerland than Swiss citizens. 57% of people doing research and development in Switzerland are not Swiss citizens. The people that we invited from all over the world to come and do research here. Conversely, because you could say, oh, that's brain drain, right? So you, you're taking away the clever people from the world. Conversely, Switzerland has a second interest in statistics. We're, the, we're a, city, a country with the second highest diaspora of scientists per capita. India is number one. Switzerland is number two. A third of the people with a Swiss passport doing research and development are outside of Switzerland. We send them out. We say, go and discover the world. Some will come back. Some will stay as ambassadors of our country, right? So it's not, and then you can say, this is brain drain, right? So you lose them. It is, but it's, it's a win. So basically, by having people come, people go, we have brain circulation. And I think this is essential for mutual understanding and for getting the ideas to go. Knowledge knows no border. Research knows no border. I think scientists need to know no border. Humans should know no borders. I think this exchange, this working together, is what makes this country a, a very strong country in research and development. I think everybody should be offered this opportunity. Absolutely brilliant messages. Thank you so much, Michael. Guy, your time. Yeah, I just want to add some perspective. Uh, yesterday we discussed about the leadership competencies for the 21st century, and I've addressed that we need to move forward because we have uh, a lot of international mobility, and also talk about the economic shift, uh, power shift, and uh, the, the fact that we have to move around and to work together becomes important. So in the perspective of exchange, uh, student exchange going in all the univer all university and to, to collaborate together is important. But I see several challenges, actually three main challenges popping up. Uh, if I take the example, for example, from Toulouse Business School and Paris Business School, we had at uh, one point many Indian students coming to the school. And one challenge was for the professor to understand how to deal and culturally uh, with the new uh, student um, figure that we, ha we were having. And they were struggling with this. To understand how to lecture in this kind of context was a challenge. The second challenge I saw is in teamworks, people tend to group based on their origin. So the, f the managing to, sh to mix the, uh, the students together to work really globally is an issue that we need to, to assess uh, and to address. And the third challenge that I was saying like, is that we're using too many 
uh, case studies from Western companies. And there is a need to incorporate much more case studies from companies from India, from Africa, from Asia, from all around the world, from South Latin America, for our students to get this pr global perspective of how other companies around the world are doing, what other solutions do they find, then we have just much bigger breadth of uh, creativity and of possibilities. Thank you very much, Guy. Actually, you mentioned something which is very important, which is the gap. If we look at the, for example, the global university leadership for in uh, Davos, but also in many other associations, it's very much North America and Europe predominantly. Somehow we need to include the rest of the world. If we, if we talk about global universities, they cannot be only the universities in Northern America and, and Europe. And unfortunately, I think also the ranking systems, the uh, Times Higher Education and QS, somehow because of the nature of the, how they evaluate universities, they also naturally, historically, they give preference to Northern America and Europe. But we need to open that. And we are very happy to see already very successful, one of them, Jindal University, that, that is breaking those walls of the thinking that only in uh, Western world uh, the science can flourish. Yes, uh, who wants to follow? I want to quickly add that it should not only be limited to that expansion, but also new regions of the world. For example, the Caspian region itself. Uh, I don't see any reason why there cannot be an imagination within the Caspian region, but also in broader uh, Central Asia, where the emphasis and importance of universities to be drivers of economic and social change can't be emphasized. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at the experience of China, uh, one of the things that we can learn from the Chinese imagination is that significant investments have been made towards promoting higher education, including research. And today, some of the leading Chinese universities are competing with the best in the world. And we in India would like to draw inspiration from that experience, but there is a case for the Caspian region to recognize the importance of how universities can fundamentally transform societies, not only socially, but also economically, and including investing in what I call demographic dividend, so that young people can play a leadership role. Very good to hear this exactly from the stage of the Caspian Week. Thank you. I Mike. cannot agree more. I think for a region, for a country, it's essential to have a strong university system for the next generation. Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa would be another example where really we're waiting for these universities to rise and help the continent grow. At the same time, and that was already mentioned, the university needs to have regional roots. It needs to be there. It needs to also adapt to the culture of the region. I think that the strengths of the universities around the world is to have different cultures, different ways of looking at the problem, and to exchange then, so that we can come together to the best generation. So I think a global university today needs to be like a tree, rooted locally, but with branches that go all around the world. Excellent expression, really. Thank you, Michael. Alicia. You know, and just to build off of what Mike just said, when we think about um, these anchor universities as anchors within the communities that they dwell in. If you just look at our, um, at Hopkins and other universities around the world, they're the generators of job growth. So Hopkins is 50% of the job growth in Maryland is due to Hopkins alone. And so if you think about what the university has as a dividend to the communities that they dwell in, it's not just around um, pulling the resources globally and locally, but it's also anchoring that city and grounding it in the research and development that you're working on. And what we should not fear is that one, individuals coming globally should be able to find a home within those local communities. But we also should not be afraid of them taking back the resources from our institutions into the places that they came from so that those places can thrive. And, and understanding that the universities that are located in Africa and Asia are also the, doing the same thing in those communities, really helping them to thrive and grow as a part of a sustainable strategy and policy. Very well said, Alicia, and I cannot give another good example, which is Haryana, where Jindal Global University and the delivery, you, you will see for 10 years since the university has opened in 2009 and comparing to today, how much new jobs, how much new shops, how much new development are around Jindal Global University, which suggests that university can play an excellent role in terms of community services and building up sustainable future. 
Guy, you want to follow? Yeah, to add a point about having a local uh, presence from international university in different regions of the world, why it is important? Because if you look at the future of jobs, it's going to be an area that we are not so present now, like in uh, Asia, in Africa, this is what we perceive that is the future is going to come. And having local presence gives the opportunity to uh, students uh, here to go there to understand better the culture and to understand how they can actually find jobs in this region, because jobs will be there. And it would be also very helpful to avoid issues that we are facing when Sinjeta got bought by a Chinese com uh, company, because the, my friends working in the position there said, it's difficult for us, we don't understand their leadership approach, uh, I have a problem, we don't understand how to work, it's shifting the way we think, uh, it's very not comfortable at the moment. So this, this will help us bridge the gap. Excellent. I think innovation and imagination are important. We don't know the future of the job market. In 2030 and 2050, jobs might be not the same as they are now. How do we prepare students for that time when jobs will be very different? And one answer is exactly as uh, all our panelists said. We need to encourage students also to think innovatively, how to self-employ themselves, how to start up their own career. And many do. Many already ask for space to have their laboratory in campus and do their own work. Yes. In, in the world of universities, the last 10 years, it was predicted that the arrival of MOOCs and online learning and other types of platforms will lead to the demise of the brick and mortar university campuses that we have understood. And that was one of the, you know, extraordinary wrong predictions that had happened. And we in the university world are very conscious of that and we are very happy about it, at least personally speaking. So I say this because of the fact that Davos type forums sometimes actually has a potential to make a mistake of predicting a future and end up Taking, getting it wrong and this is one example and I want to say that because we in universities strongly believe that the most important aspect of our universities uh, in responsibility is to inspire young minds to be able to fire their imagination so that they can elevate themselves to achieve something extraordinary for themselves and for impact in the world to also to be able to tell them that the contemporary views that are prevailing in the world may not actually be right and they need to understand and actually shape that perspective. And so, I am, while I appreciate the space for digital learning and use of technology, including conscious of the arrival of artificial intelligence and robotics and machine learning, I am also conscious of the fact that there are huge ethical issues, including issues related to privacy, that need to be interrogated and examined and analyzed and even articulated by universities. Yeah. Michael, Alicia will follow, but I would like also the audience to prepare a couple of questions. We couldn't make it yesterday, there was a shortage of time, but today I would like to give the audience some time for questions. I'd just like Michael, to yes. bounce up on that because it, it comes to the central value that the university brings to the education that we give to our students. I'm sure every time a new technology comes, people will say the university will disappear. I think MOOCs are great for teaching facts, right? It's, it's a better book. But every time a technology came, I'm sure we heard the same thing. I'm sure when Gutenberg invented the book, people said, why should my son go to university? He could just read the book. The facts are in the book. The university did not disappear then. The universities will not disappear now. And that is because we are social people. We interact. We learn by interacting with others. People who come into my class at 8 a.m. on Monday morning, they don't come because of the facts. They come because of the peers with whom they interact to learn. We teach our students teamwork, we teach them creativity, we teach them critical thinking. These are all things that you need to do in interactions. That's what we give them. We give them not only facts, we give them a backpack full of tools that they need to then take out into the world to address the problems that they will be confronting. And that's why the universities will continue to be there. It's a place for people, people to learn, people to teach. By the way, if, if you look at the universities which existed since the 11th and 12th century, a lot of businesses has changed. Everything else changed. Mm -hmm. The Silver Road is no longer there. there. There are new products that replace the products of the last century. But the fact that we have universities from Bologna and from Jagiellonian and Oxford, and they found one in Morocco which is even predating all of this, means that universities remain forever. Mm -hmm. right. And the only point I was going to add to build off of Michael's point was, um, one, allowing for those, um, those opportunities for uh, learning and also innovation to happen 
after graduation ends, right? And so um, one of the two of the innovations that we've tried to employ at Hopkins have been one, Fast Forward University to allow for those, um, the research and the technology and the innovation that is created by the young minds that are within the university setting, not to finish at the time of graduation, but to really allow for them to have a home within our local community to thrive and to grow into businesses that ultimately will stay in place. The second is really our social innovation lab, to recognize that innovation just doesn't come from those who produce products, but also those who are allowed to have a place to grow ideas that may erupt into and transform into social enterprises to solve some of the social issues and some of the um, business issues that we think about. And so in those two ways, I think thinking beyond the time of graduation as what does that mean for us to be sustainable in the communities to have people find a place to have their ideas grow in place. Exactly. In fact, sustainability means to do something after graduation. It's not a pro project to finish and to graduate and go away. Mm -hmm. Sustainability is to sustain, mm -hmm. to stay after. Yeah. And exactly, universities have that role to build up relationship with the alumni and to develop that uh, sustained process. Now, we have uh, about seven, eight minutes for questions and answers. So I'm turning to the audience and inviting uh, Comments and questions, please. Who would like to go first? Yes, please. Uh, good day, Igor Almazov, ABB Switzerland. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, describing, uh, I would say, a global uh, educational system mm -hmm. and uh, sustainable uh, questions. Uh, if we talk about talk about sustainability, I think uh, we're also talking about some. Uh, sustainable education in some uh, countries, developing countries, but we, are, we don't see uh, big educational centers. Because as we know today, Western Europe, U US, and um, probably in Russia, we, we see uh, quite good uh, big uh, universities, but in uh, developing uh, countries, at least not, not so famous or not so strong, like India, in China, uh, maybe in the Caspian region, uh, there are not so well-known uh, educational centers. And what do you think, um, who will play a major role to develop those centers locally to sustain uh, the world? It should be corporations, national governments, or maybe uh, Harvard University will open a filial in, uh, in Baku or somewhere else. What do you think, how it should grow up? Thank you for this uh, very practical and concrete question. What, what can be done for yeah. locations which don't have the history and the science and the knowledge how to build a world-class university? So I think the first thing is you're absolutely right that uh, educa higher education in particular has received lesser attention in many developing countries and there are a number of reasons. But if I were to look at the future, uh, first of all I would say that governments need to have a far-sighted vision about the idea of a university and how universities can build a future knowledge society and how it can contribute to the social and economic development of a nation. Second, I also think that we need to significantly focus on private philanthropy. I mean, there, are, there is a major challenge in developing countries that not uh, all of them have a significant GDP investment in higher education and they have very good reasons they need to make choices between investing in health sector or infrastructure and other things. So we need to have a stronger role for the private sector. Here I am in favor of a strong not-for-profit uh, philanthropically enabled type universities. If you look at the evolution of American universities, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, uh, you know, NYU, uh, MIT, these are all private philanthropic not-for-profit institutions and we need to bring that vision and imagination into the developing countries more and more. In fact, our own university was created through a philanthropic initiative of our benefactor, Mr. Naveen Jindal. And this was exactly modeled in the lines of other philanthropic initiatives, particularly in the United States, because the 
depending upon the government alone is not going to make a difference third i also think that there is a need for global philanthropy to commit towards education in fact like for example bill and bill and melinda gate foundation type organizations invest in health there is a even greater importance for investing in universities because they are going to shape the future of the society and the world at large and unfortunately corporations and companies and even at times foundations end up having short sighted vision and myopic goals when it comes to looking at how universities have impacted when you are looking at a university you need to have a more longitudinal impact how it shapes the future and the society at large at the same time, even if you have international philanthropy, you need to remember this local anchoring. Yes. I think what will not function is if you try to make a second little Harvard in Baku. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, because that becomes neo in, 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 at the intellectual level. So, so having a, a strong co cooperation, Correct. working together, exchange of students, stuff like that. But I, at the end, again, the culture of Baku will have to develop so that they become a center. You cannot have a, a, a foreign university there. It needs to grow locally and become the University of Baku for the people of Baku. Absolutely correct. And as we see a lot of those uh, filials or branches that universities open, mostly the purpose is to recruit students, somehow for students not to travel to the main campus to be educated locally. It serves some purpose, but again, we, we need the full picture, as Raj explained. We need all three elements here in order to build up uh, higher education of a standard were necessary for the global market. Uh, anything else? Yes, Guy. Yeah, well, if I can just add a point uh, on, about on what everything that has been said yet. I really believe that to have local participants, local stakeholders getting involved, like local companies, for example, because these are the people we're going to need the skills to actually help them grow in the future. So to develop the skills locally, to uh, actually privately be involved, I think it's a very important key. Maybe we need to create much more awareness. I, I think now I'm going often to Senegal, and I don't see so much this awareness there. Maybe there is a, we need to work to develop this awareness, and I don't know where the starting point so far, uh, but the involvement of private companies locally is important. They are the ones that are going to need the skills and the people. Thank you very much. Vitaly has a question, please. Yes, uh, Vitaly Kozachenko, Managing Director of Forty Law. So it's clear that technology is not making universities obsolete. Uh, my question is, um, how are universities going to evolve uh, because of the technology? Uh, because, well, you can have, uh, now have video lectures, for example, right? And universities are important because uh, of the interaction, as you mentioned. And in a room with 300 people, you can't have a meaningful interaction, right? On the other hand, um, interaction is expensive because if you have a professor and five students like you have in Oxford, that cannot make universities inclusive. So do you have any ideas as to how you are going to evolve to make universities work in terms of interaction and at the same time make them inclusive? Thank you very much, Vitaly. It's very good to point that the new technologies actually present challenges but also presents opportunities and please what is so, the experience uh, i think there is a there is a certain privilege of older universities having been benefited by it i studied at oxford and i know the one on one tutorial experience i would uh, i was richly benefited by that but having said that i think the word is blended learning uh, the reason i say blended learning is that technology has a very important role to play but it, 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 it's, it's a supplemental role when it comes to the educational imagination and inspiration that happens in the classroom. I entirely agree with you that larger classrooms tend sometimes tend to focus on the syllabus and the courses and individual attention is lost and that's where certain amount of recorded lectures and availability for students to be able to access that. Khan Academy is a good example, Coursera is a good example, both are different visions, one is entirely free, other you have to pay for it, but the point is there is a space for it. The second thing I think is we should recognize that universities have a larger role to play 
towards contributing to the society at large, which is not limited to only its students. So, for example, if there is a, a global university and lots of you know wonderful professors are teaching for the students here, at best, even large universities can only cater to a limited number of people. I don't see any reason why some of what is being taught in those universities are recorded and be made available for students who simply can't afford to or cannot access for a number of reasons to that university's resource. And that's the kind of democratization of intellectual resource and democratization of the university space that digital technologies can contribute to. The third, I think, which is very important for companies and corporations which are involved in innovations and technology, engage with universities so that some of those technologies can become useful and applicable for what happens in a university, including, for example, the idea of a flipped classroom or to what extent, extent examination, assessment, monitoring of student uh, you know, learning experiences can be further enhanced by the use of technology. All these things require collaboration and participation and a, a deeper sense of stakeholdership in relation to what happens within a university. Okay. Quickly, we have another panel without a break, so please, Alicia first. Sure, very quickly. I just think the digital versus the physical um, domain for education, what we'll see is that the digital will allow for individuals who are often on the educational opportunity sideline to be embedded into the university setting. I think we see corporations like Starbucks and Amazon utilizing digital um, universities as a way to allow for its workforce to gain an education that will allow for them to move up socially, um, um, have social mobility. But I think the collision points that happen on a university campus uh, can't be um, understated and the plural and what that does for pluralis pluralism in, in our society and so I think you will see corporations trying to mimic and supplement that pluralism that happens on a university campus by supplementing with the digital space but also universities still wanting those collision points um, to happen so that really the universities can foster the sort of society that we that they aim to foster. The physical reality and the digital aspiration has now given rise to a new term called fidgetal. The future is fidgetal. I just want to add something quickly. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> I would just like to add one point. Things are happening outside of classroom, not in classroom. Now I want you to picture a Davos online. <laughs> versus a Davos, we are here. What's happening here? This is the difference between digital and physical education. We come, knowledge is to, get to, be, to, take, to be taken and to do something with it. And you do something with it outside of classroom with people you meet outside of classroom. Okay? <laughs> Absolutely. But we still we're happy to yes. come and meet physically. <laughs> so that's the word we will take. Fidgetal will be the word we will take out of this panel. Ma Mike? Yeah, no. No. Okay, thank you very much. It was wonderful to have you all and uh, really a very rich and uh, memorable discussion. Thank you. Let's give a big applause to our panel.